Merci, bonjour à tous. Uh, good morning or maybe good afternoon now to, to all of you and welcome for, for this uh, stimulating discussion. So the question is, how can we feed the planet without destroying it? Well, wow, that is a big challenge. And to address it today, we have two very knowledgeable guests, two very experienced speakers. Um, and you know, on this kind of topic, we often hear scaremongers, and we journalists like to, to listen to scaremongers. So maybe Jacques and Mo will be doing a bit of scaremongering, but what's more important, we have two speakers who every day struggle to make this planet a better world, and every day work to find solutions. So I think this is what we are going to, to stress. Um, you have their bios in your app, in the conference app, but let me introduce them very briefly. Mo Ibrahim, welcome again. Um, you were born in Sudan, raised in Egypt, at least partly, educated in Britain. Um, again, I'm doing this very briefly to, to save some time for the discussion. Uh, you founded a very successful telecom company, Celtel, which um, at one stage had subscribers in 14 African countries, a very successful company. You sold it now almost 15 years ago, and you created your own foundation, the Ibrahim Mo, uh, Mo Ibrahim, sorry, Foundation, uh, which is dedicated on improving governance in Africa. It publishes every year, among many other things, uh, an index of good governance in Africa. Um, Jacques Attali, of course, our French audience know you well, but we have also an international audience here. Um, maybe I can remind that you became known in, in France for being the special advisor of President François Mitterrand. Um, and for our international audience, I, I wanted to, uh, um, to tell, for those who may not know this, that 10 years ago, President Sarkozy asked you to um, propose, make some proposals to boost job creations in France, to liberalize the economy, and to help you writing this report, you picked up a young and totally unknown civil servant whose name is Emmanuel Macron. Um, uh, you have written numerous books on many different topics, uh, ranging from economy to history and music. I just want to mention one because it's related to today's discussion. Uh, the French title is Histoire with an S, Histoire de l'Alimentation, and Jacques, you just told me that it was about to be translated in English. Do, do you know uh, what would be the title in English? It will be published in 20 languages, including English, but uh, I think the title will be the same, Histories, histories of, of Food. Okay, thank you, Jacques. Um, so maybe to, to begin our, our discussion, I wanted to start just with basic facts, because maybe not everyone in the audience is a specialist and is an expert, of this very challenging issue of how can we feed the planet without destroying it. So just let's start with very basic and current facts. What, what's the situation today? From what I read, it has not improved on the contrary these past years. Can, Jack, maybe can you just give very basic facts of the current situation today and then we will talk about the challenges for tomorrow. Well, today, what's the there, situation? There are two sides of the coin. Uh, one is the side which is related to uh, quantitative figures. And on quantitative figures, uh, it's well known that one third of what is produced is uh, spoiled. Uh, first one I want to one say, third is spoiled. First, I want shoot. to say that I'm very honored to be on the same panel that Mo, which I admire of what he's doing since many years, and it's really a great honor to chair uh, this uh, session with him. One third is, is, uh, is spoiled. Uh, one billion people are not eating enough to survive. And uh, we may say that the uh, consequence of the nature of, co of food of, of today is that many people are not dying for lack of food, but are dying for bad food. We can go on and on on the fact that uh, land is spoiled, um, that's a huge consequences on climate. We use a lot of uh, chemistry, you can be avoided, and it's a terrible uh, consequence. Uh, we, we come back to that, we use too much sugar, We ma many uh, things can be said. But this is only one side of a coin, and we, all, we only insist on this quantitative. There's another side of a coin, which is maybe more fundamental. 
is that since the beginning of history, and that was the subject of his book, to understand what means to, to eat. Eat means uh, anecdotically food. The most important thing of food or eating or meals is the meal. Is the fact that we spend time together. And what is uh, maybe one of the most threatening, frightening, challenging issue of today is that the meal is disappearing. Uh, I can make a long story short, a long story, but since the middle of the 20th, of the 19th century, the American capitalism has understood that the meal is dangerous for the economy. You spend time, you don't buy, you don't work, and you talk, very dangerous. Therefore, they have done whatever they can do to destroy the meal, to let people alone, to eat just uh, en passant, uh, whatever. And then we end up going in the direction of uh, uh, lonely zombies eating whatever it is without talking, without discussing. And what is culture? What is mankind if it's not conversations? And then, of course, we are going to discuss, are we going to be able to feed 12 billion people? Fine, you can feed 20, 12 billion zombies. I reassure you, we can do it. We can even do it uh, with biological food. We can do, even do it by uh, saving Earth as a planet in terms of climate. But are we going to save the real nature of mankind, which is conversations? Are we going to go back to meals? Uh, to take time, to be slow, to have ideas wh while talking with another, that's another fine of it. And it's much more difficult to save a meal and the conversation. Just to finish, in the ancient Egyptian hieroglyph, the same hieroglyph means uh, eat, speak, and love. And that is still true. That's very interesting. So to, to stick with the, the current facts, please, uh, Mo, you can take the, the mic. Um, of course, Jacques reminded that today almost one billion people do not eat enough, and uh, most of these people live in Africa. Is that correct? Still correct? Yeah, so. yeah uh, let me just take a step back, and uh, I, I just say I'm really worried. Uh, because we are facing really global challenges. At the same time, we see global governance is crumbling. And uh, no single nation, no single people can deal with the issues that are facing us by themselves. And this is the crucial time for us to work together to meet what I see as existential threat to civilization, to our existence. The planet is not in danger. The planet is wonderful, will always be there. The planet doesn't need the human race. The human race is in danger. We may go, but the planet will stay and adapt and, and create whatever life uh, can suit it. And this is something we need to realize. Unfortunately, <laughs> we are unable to act together as human beings to deal, to deal with these issues. So I'm, I'm really worried. Uh, somehow we develop uh, this culture of immediate grat gratification. Uh, I did not see any leader in the Western countries or the Western democracies uh, who is not campaigning on elect me because I'm going to reduce taxes. Every leader is competing with other leaders about how I'm going to reduce taxes. None of them is being honest to say, you know what, actually we need to increase taxes maybe because we need to deal with this climate change, where the funds come from. We need to deal with inequality. We need to deal with the health issues, insurance, I mean, Health issues is, is a major problem. We have a population which is getting older and older. The span of life is, is 86 years old now and growing. Who's going to deal with those people? And where the funds come from? The medicine sciences are advancing. We can replace anybody of your part almost now. 
And who's going to deal with that? Are you going to be faced with decisions? Uh, you live, you don't live, because it costs us more. Or that's what we're going to be faced with. So we're facing a lot of challenges, which are really, by the nature, global. But our approach to this is, is, is piecemeal, uh, selfish, uh, transactional, and we're not making any uh, tangible progress. So I'm, I'm really worried about all these issues. And that, of course, includes the issue of nutrition and food mm -hmm. and how we, how we manage that. Mm -hmm. If I go specifically in the area of, 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 of food production or agriculture and, and, and people, from the point of view of an African, uh, look, it is a very close relationship b between climate and food. Climate affects food, and food aff affects climate, and that needs to be managed. Uh, we, look, African farmers now don't know anymore who went to plant their seeds. They planted seeds where, at the time when they used to do it, you know, for thousands of years, and the rain doesn't come. And then the rain comes, and it is not a rain, it is a flood it washes the seeds away. So there is climate is really affecting our ability to produce food. And of course, agriculture is a large emitter also of, 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 of greenhouse ga gases. That relationship needs to be managed. But one could think, uh, well, well, there is a growing awareness uh, on uh climate change, a lot of talk, all, all the world leaders talk about climate change, but one, when we see these figures, uh, about one billion people don't eat enough every day, the population of Africa is going to double in about 20, less than 20 years. Uh, shouldn't we focus more just on this emergency of feeding the people and maybe forget a bit about the climate change, uh, which is not going no, to no, change no, no, the... No, 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 we, we, I wanted to challenge you on this. <laughs> no, but uh, the two are related. Because you can, uh, if you do the wrong, uh, you know, adopt the wrong policies in agriculture, you're going to accelerate climate change also. Mm -hmm. That's why I said it's a, we need to develop the right policies, which we, we, we need to find deforestation, we need to, be, uh, to see, you know, what kind of fertilizers cause problems. Maybe we should eat less meat, because unfortunately animals contribute a lot to, through the digestion process to the, to the gases problem. And so you say, sorry, Mo, you say maybe we should uh, eat less meat. I think you have uh, your opinion on this question. Well, is it, uh, if we see, if we look only at, is it the, course, uh, uh, if we look only at the quantitative side of a coin, and I will come back to the other side, which is for me also important. I totally agree with Mo. Many things must be done. First, we must be sure, and that has been said on and on by uh, FAO reports that um, Earth can feed 12 billion people uh, sustainably. What we call in our foundation positive economy, which means working in the interest of next generation, and then positive... Sorry, I, I forgot to, to no. in my introduction to say that you lead the yeah, positive... Positive foundation works foundation. in the interest of next generations, and we have developed a lot of concepts linked to that, including the concept of positive food, which means food that can be sustainable both socially and ecologically. That can work. A huge amount of reforms are needed. They are possible, maybe... Uh, very utopian, but one reform. Let me make the list of reforms. One will be uh, training the peasants in order for them to know the technologies of the world, and including the fact that they can develop their productions without uh, pesticides. Second, to uh, develop property for peasants on small uh, farms, and then destroy the larger farms, destroy them, cut them which is very difficult, almost impossible, if you see what happened in China, in Africa, elsewhere. We need to have small farms owned by the peasants with huge level of knowledge, one. Second, we need to have a strong control of the uh, food uh, industry in order to forbid them to use artificial sugar and to develop advertising on things. They are as criminals as the tobacco industry. They kill people. 
uh, French, uh, Swiss, American, Chinese, wherever companies of food are not well controlled. And they should be much more controlled in order to eliminate sugar. Don't develop artificial food for babies, which lead them to use artificial food in the future. If we delete that, these artificial uh, sugar, as well as all these snacks and all that, which is leading to the other side of the coin, that's one. This should be forbidden. And in order to forbid them, we need to have international agreement, which is far from existing, international tribunal to judge them if they do uh, mistakes. I dream of an internal tribu tribunal to judge uh, food industry. That is needed because they could be, they have been, and they could be if they continue uh, considered as criminal for the, uh, the uh, next generations. What else should be done? One, as you said, is reducing massively the use of uh, 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 meat. This is both a global issue and a personal issue. If we want to be positive in our food, we need one, you eat as, many, as minimum as possible uh, meat. Minimum, if not zero. Second, don't eat fish when it's not the season of the fish and it is when it is not really sustainable fish. And it's not the same sustainable fish everywhere on, in each uh, season. Three, eat slowly. Never eat between meals. Don't eat sugar. Uh, eat not alone. Have a day of diet once a week. Very easy things that are agreed. I, I have to learn to, to eat slowly. Yeah, that, me too. <laughs> Which is a, a, a global recipe that has been agreed uh, uh, from the uh, different generations and different cultures, which is common. We know that. If we do that, then we will go beyond the first challenge, which is not food. The first challenge is water. Mankind, and it is the case in your country as well as everywhere in Africa, the first challenge that we are going to face is uh, water. And water is linked to meat. The second challenge that we are going to, fa to face is the, the use of pesticides, which is a danger for climate and for uh, population. And then all is related to sugar, which is diabetes and all that. We can do it. It's a matter of global reforms, which are huge, what I mentioned, and personal behavior. If there is only global reforms and not personal behavior, that will not change. If there is global reform and personal reforms and personal behavior change, that will work. Then think of what you are, you are going to do in the next weeks or days in your personal behavior. If you do what I said, you will have your small part of a change. But it will not be enough. If we not criminalize the use of artificial sugar, nothing will change. And it's far from being done. Because what I've learned is that these companies are, with tobacco and more than any others, amazingly powerful in terms of lobbying. Uh, you, you were kind enough to mention my book, but in my book I mention studies by Harvard professors or very uh, brilliant academicians that have been financed by the sugar industry to demonstrate that uh, sugar is, is fine. And of course, that's crooks. Uh, and uh, we have to avoid that, and it's a matter of uh, democracy. Um, Jacques has very tough uh, proposals. I, I want to, to uh, hear from you, Mo, about the, the, Jacques' proposal on small farms. Jacques is tough. He says we should uh, eradicate very big farms. What do you think of this scene from your African point of view? Uh, to be honest, I, I struggle with what is the best form of uh, agricultural industry in Africa. Uh, most of African agriculture now is based on uh, subsistence farming, which everybody agree is no good. Africa has huge amount of land. And by the way, Africa is not what you see when you look at the Google map because this artificially shrunk, so the map looks sensible. Africa is huge as a landmass. It takes you 10 hours to cross Africa from one end to end by, by, by a jet. 
if you find one, yes. <laughs> so it is uh, now, there is... Sorry to interrupt, but I read that 80% of the world's uncultivated arable land is, is in, in Africa. Africa. The vast majority of arable is in Africa. And that needs development. Even the developed agricultural land, the production there is like 20% probably of the productivity uh, elsewhere, whether the United States or Australia or elsewhere. So these are good news actually, because it shows us there is a huge headroom uh, really uh, to develop that. What we're struggling with is what is the most effective model of, 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 of agriculture. We need to turn agriculture from subsistence to really a sexy industry. We want young people to go back to the rural area. And instead, we see uh, African cities are the largest uh, uh, or the fastest growing cities in the world. The huge migration from rural areas to, to cities. Obviously, because you don't have services in the rural area. You don't have internet, you don't have TV, you don't have cinemas, you don't have all the attraction and the lights of the big city. And young people also don't see any future in subsistence agriculture. Uh, what we need is a new model of agriculture. And I don't, I don't have the answer to that, to be honest. I, I don't know. But that's something we need to search for. We need to experiment. Some people suggested co-ops. Some uh, be, you know, people suggested uh, uh, modern <coughs> small farms. Some people said agribusiness. Uh, I, I'm not an expert in this area. I don't know what is it, but maybe we should try and see the different models and see what works. Well, let's, let's be pragmatic and see what works. Uh, but what we need is to really create uh, uh, the opportunity to develop a healthy agricultural system. That will hit a number of things. First, the production target, because we need to eat. And we cannot get any more food from Europe or United States or anywhere else is or China is done. The only hope for more food will come from Africa. So we need to all pay attention to that. That also deals with the problem of young people. Africa has a different demo demography from any other part of the world. Most of African people are young. Over half our population are really below 19 years old or so. And that is increasing. Where are those guys going to go? You guys don't want them in Europe. We cannot ship them to Europe. I mean, you, 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 Europe will fail, you know, you, you know that. One million people almost doubled Merkel. So we cannot send those people to you. What we need, actually, those people not to die in the Mediterranean, we want them to find jobs. And that's a sector which can create millions and millions of jobs. We need decent jobs for these people with decent income. So. Agriculture, I want it to be sexy, you know, wonderful to work on agriculture. That's important, not only for Africa, but for everybody, for you guys also to continue to eat at your old age, uh, which may be a problem. But I think that is uh, uh, something important for us. Jack, you want to in the same direction, I do agree. Uh, we cannot have the same recipe everywhere. Another dimension which is important in the line of what has been said is that we should be aware that if we want to have good food, what, what I call positive food and sustainable positive planet, that means that we have, when we can afford it, to spend a larger share of our revenue in food. Uh, the share of the revenue we spend in food a century ago was 80% of our revenue. Fortunately, go down, but now it's too low. Uh, we should spend more than 10% of what we spend in food and go to 20 or 25. And if we have to choose between garbage food and uh, third uh, mobile phone, we should choose good food and not a third mobile phone, which is not the case today. And it's very important to think that we should spend more on food, more, and, and that will give not only healthy food for us, uh, consumers, but a better revenue for peasants, if we can inter uh, eliminate the intermediaries, it's what we do in many sectors with Positive Planet, when we help peasants to develop and get rid of uh, intermediaries. But important to realize that food is an element of life, and we should spend much more on, on that. 
What is also important is to realize that we have to uh, save or even uh, give a new birth to uh, local food. You mentioned rightly, both of you, that Africa is uh, full of potential uh, uh, lands, but it's also full of plants, which are amazingly good for food and are not used anymore. I just mentioned uh, uh, Moringa, for instance, which is an amazing plant, uh, but not used anymore. And what is strange, when you go in, a, in an African country, uh, uh, for instance, if you go in uh, West Africa, what do you see? You see that the peasants are producing rice, but they cannot afford to eat it because it's too expensive. When they sell it, they go abroad, and that, what do they eat? They eat very bad rice coming from Thailand, and uh, third or fourth category uh, chicken wings coming from the garbage of Europe. It's a shame. It's a shame. Then uh, local food should be first given to local populations. Good food should be given. It's what we uh, also, it's good, is linked to the fact that it's better to use food produced locally in order to avoid the cost of transportation, which is bad for climate change. And the fact that Senegalese peasants eat Thailand rice while they export to Europe uh, Senegalese rice is crazy. Therefore, we have to uh, try to push uh, the development of local production for local people. Because of the growing awareness on climate change, um, there is an issue about biofuels. Some people lobby to, to, to develop biofuels. Uh, is it a big issue, according to you, this potential competition for land between uh, um, growing uh, some crops for biofuels or growing right. some crops the, to feed people? Is the it best, a, a the big best issue? In, the best energy is the energy you don't spend, you, don't, you save then biofuel is not a solution. Uh, it's not a solution, by all means it is not. What's your opinion on this, Mo? Uh, yeah, I agree. I, 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 if we're going to face shortage of food, I mean, not in the agriculture, well, we, there are other ways to generate energy, and we're making a lot of progress there. Uh, but really the point I want to make, all the issues we're discussing and we hope to achieve, how are we going to do it? That's the issue. It needs to be done. And none of this can be done without global cooperation. Where is this global cooperation? Absolutely. Carbon levels increased last year. You are aware of that. So we're going backward. I mean, we're not going forward. And we are busy just uh, bickering about this and that. And we're not seeing really the huge danger facing us in 20 or 30 years of the assumption, well, I'm going to be died, dead by then. I don't care. Excuse me. But what about our kids? And this is, this is our, we are such a selfish generation that we are all consumed about our well-being today. You know, no, don't spend money on in mitigation. Don't spend money on infrastructure. Don't spend money on this. It's, 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 I mean, most of our audience here are Americans. And to be honest, I really hate when I land in New York. You know what? I travel in the most awful backward motorway to Manhattan. Roads in Ouagadougou is far better than roads in New York. And say, excuse me, this is the most rich and, 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 and wonderfully advanced country in the world. Why don't you fix your infrastructure? How do you live with these roads in Manhattan? It's, it's really a shame. When the car go in the tunnel under, under the river, I keep looking and you just worry about the water seeping through because I know it is a very old tunnel. And uh, you know, the time I come out, I say, oh my God, thanks God, I came out alive. Why we do that? And, and you know, I, it just, I'm asking, are, are people so selfish? They are, when the current government came to US, you talked about infrastructure, we're gonna spend this, you know, and what you did, two trillion dollars, they gave away, in, you know, tax uh, handouts for people. Instead of doing, because it's immediate gratification. I need something now. I need to eat. I need to buy a new car. I need to buy a new house. I need to buy as far as the future goes to hell. And this, it doesn't work. I think we need to change. There's an issue of culture here, issue of attitude. And I think it's an issue of also of 
basic humanity. We need to care about the children, our grandchildren, etc. It's not only us. And uh, uh, that, that really I feel strongly about. Jack, you wanted to make a point. Uh, one, uh, it is in our selfish interest to be altruistic. And it is in such selfish interest to be interested in the uh, well-being of generations which has not even been born. Because suppose that no one is uh, uh, going to come to Earth after us, that would be a, a, a hell for everybody in this room. Therefore, we have an interest. Then to be altruist is simply a rational way of being, uh, of being selfish. And it's very difficult to understand, but it's important. Second, you're right to say that the most important thing in the future at the world level is infrastructure. Not any kind of infrastructure. Infrastructure can be terribly really bad. But what could be called positive infrastructure, which is sustainable, you don't need to have more uh, highways if you want to get rid of cars, but you need to have good roads if you want to use that for public transportation. And therefore, I'm sure that the most important thing to do in the future is to develop, precise what is exactly uh, positive infrastructure and to do it. And you're right to say that the preference for short term has killed that. Third, Many reforms must be done, and you're right to say that it should be done at the international level. In our foundation, the Positive Planet, we have tried since two years to develop a manifesto of what should be done uh, for the next generation. And we developed uh, 20 propositions that have been uh, clearly developed by a very large group of experts worldwide. We have, we have uh, uh, worked with more than 60,000 people to do that, and we have created this uh, 20 proposals that you can find on our website that we have been proposing to the G20 in Buenos Aires and to the G20 in Osaka last year and that we are going to propose also to the next G20 in Saudi Arabia. These 20 proposals that we are also going to develop and you are welcome to our next summit which is taking place in Paris uh, December 3rd and we will be delighted to have you as one of the speakers in December 3rd as I told you. We, we develop um, uh, this proposal. Of course they are very utopian. The need for uh, a growing pr price of uh, carbon. That's, that's a must. We must do it. Second, uh, reforms on uh, girl education, um, creation of a charter to, to avoid uh, misuse of artificial intelligence. 20 proposals that must be done. If they are not done, as Mo said, we will not, there will be nobody, no human being on earth in the 22nd century. Nobody, if we don't do it. If we do it, we can have a, a wonderful future. It's up to us, it's up to all of us here to uh, challenge the leaders and do it. Of course, it's not linked to the uh, nitty gritty details of uh, Mr. Trump comedy on the media or whatever happening in other countries. It's not the only one uh, clown in the world, but uh, we must do much more to think about long term. It's up to us to do it. And we can do it. These proposals are realistic. They can be implemented from our daily life up to the global challenges. Utopian but realistic at the same time. Yeah, can, can I just... Uh, I want to just mention a story. Uh, I don't know how you felt about G-Jack, but do you recall a few months ago when we had these massive fires in the Amazons? Everybody was enraged. Everybody was upset. And, and, but then nobody answered the question. If the Amazon is a global good and we all feel upset if something happens to it, why is it not globally funded? Why we say, no, 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 you Brazilian carry the cost of, of, of really keeping the uh, uh, Amazon he healthy because we want to have clean air to breathe. Excuse me, you want to have a clean air, you need to pay for it also. Uh, why would I? Same thing in Africa. We have all those wonderful romantic people in Europe and America telling us, oh, please, please, keep your animals uh, careful with the, your forest, careful with the. Excuse me, you want to have, you need to help, you know, because the farmers have a problem with some of these animals. They have a, so, here is the problem, we are so selfish. We just want to take what is good in this planet. We don't want to be back in this planet and we let other people deal with it. It's time for us to think as global citizens. It doesn't matter where you live. 
this part or that part, we all breathe the same air. It is one planet and we are one race here. And unless we act as one race and one group of people, we, 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 we're gonna end. I mean, we, there's no need for this human. We are not the only species on Earth. And we'll be unworthy species on this Earth and Earth will get rid of us. You need to understand that. This is gonna happen and gonna happen very soon. It's time for action. Before being a threatened species, Mankind is a threatening species. And it's why we must realize that. And threatening itself. Yeah, threatening itself, uh, committing suicide. Well, everything is on the table. We can do it. Uh, my understanding of history is that usually um, people, a lot of people realize what is needed to be done to avoid a catastrophe. Uh, if, we, if we look at history, for three, four centuries, I can give you a lot of examples of people are being lucid enough to say, if we do that, we avoid the catastrophe. And it's not done. And the catastrophe happened, and things do things after the catastrophe, if we survive. But today we are in a very difficult, different situation, is that we may not survive after the catastrophe. There was, a, for instance, in international cooperation, it was said before the uh, First World War that we need to create an organization called Société des Nations. It was, it was coined in 1906, 1906, and it was created in order to avoid the war. We had the war and we created the SDN after the war. In 1925, 26, we said, oh, SDN doesn't work, we need to create a United Nations organization to avoid the war, we had a war and we created. Now we know exactly what should be done. But the problem is that uh, uh, it's possible that there is no future after the catastrophe. If I want to sum up very simply, and you can use it for children we are or reaching around. The, the uh, end of this discussion? Yeah. Be, yeah. Mankind is able to do the best and the worst. And if you see the history of mankind since uh, 300,000 300, years, we do a little bit of good, a little bit of bad. A little more good, a little more bad. And it, the, it, mankind history is that. More bad. But it's for, and now we are beginning to turn down. I can give you a lot of index that demonstrate that we're going to turn down. And if we go down, we may be in position that we cannot go up anymore. And that we are. We are now turning, and we have to avoid to dive. We are running out of time. I had a, a last question uh, for both of you. Uh, Mo, you have your own foundation. Uh, Jacques, you run uh, the organization Positive Planet. I think uh, you had not met before. Both of you? Yeah, uh, yes. So Thank you for you to organize. So do, do you and think, we, we had a very long discussion before. Do you think that you could, you could uh, yeah. launch some projects together? Yes. To, have a, to conclude on this? Well. Yeah. Please take the, the, the mic, uh, Mo. The, take the mic, yeah. You know, we really thank you for getting political. We already started to talk before the, uh, before the panel, and we see uh, a scope for uh, a really uh, good cooperation between us. We need to cooperate. All the good people need to work together, and if to avoid, really, you know, the catastrophe. And I cannot stop. I mean, I've been talking about self-harm and how the... Uh, uh, we are, we are, we are, we are became experts in self-harm. And I, I, I just managed to see a man walking in the room here who is watching now the self-harm the British doing themselves by the Brexit. And uh, <laughs> hello. <laughs> I mean, another another exercise in self-harm we are doing. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Uh, I didn't see Michel, but it's fine to have you here, Michel. <laughs> and we, 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 what we can do together, we have developed the concept, uh, nothing can be done if it's not measured. And uh, Mo has developed the concept of uh, index of governance. We have developed the concept of indis, index of positivity. We measure the positivity of all the nations of OECD. And we hope maybe we can find common ground to develop maybe index of positivity for Africa. And when we have measure, you realize, for instance, on the OECD, we are in the OECD, we measure the concept of positivity of countries of OECD. That's clear that year after year, the Scandinavian countries are the best. They provide a lot of things of what should be done. Unfortunately, France is just um, in the middle of even lower than the middle. 
and some countries are very bad. If you measure, if you discuss the measurement, as we do wonderfully in your foundation, then they give ground to objective discussions on facts. Okay. Well, the, the diagnosis was pretty gloomy. You were at sometimes scaremongers, but I'm very happy that we ended on this very positive note, full of hope. Uh, we need utopia, we need people like you to, uh, to move forward. And please uh, join me to, to applause both Mo and Jacques.